But first this morning, his boss is dealing with an international crisis threatening our military and trade arrangements with Indonesia. And his colleague, Treasurer Joe Hockey, warns we have less than three weeks to lift the debt ceiling before facing a US-style government shutdown. Our guest today is Finance Minister Matthias Cormann and our panel, News Corp's National Economics Editor Jessica Irvine and National Political Reporter for News Corp, Lani Scar. Good morning to you all. Good morning. Senator, Tony Abbott has been uh, depicted on the front page of an Indonesian newspaper uh, overnight in a, in a very lurid uh, situation. To you, is this relations with Indonesia sinking to a new unmanageable low? Uh, we, we are totally focused on uh, building and strengthening our relationship uh, with Indonesia. Obviously, there's been uh, some strain uh, in recent days as a result of uh, uh, media uh, coverage. Uh, I mean, the Prime Minister has uh, been very clear uh, in expressing his very strong commitment uh, to continue uh, strengthen uh, our relationship with Indonesia. It's a relationship that is important for both our countries. Uh, of course, uh, we have expressed uh, regret uh, for the embarrassment caused uh, by the uh, media reports in recent days, but uh, it is really a matter, from our point of view, uh, of looking forward. But what is your reaction to this newspaper cover? Look, uh, I'm not going to uh, commentate uh, you know, media coverage uh, in Indonesia. Our focus is on uh, strengthening our relationship with Indonesia. It is a very important relationship for both of our countries. Uh, and, I mean, the, the last thing that I'm uh, interested in doing is being a commentator. Do you think Tony Abbott, um, Senator, do you think Tony Abbott has handled this in the best way possible? Why didn't he pick up the phone on the very first day that media broke about, um, news broke about this issue? I mean, he was so intent on trying to get Julie Gillard and Kevin Rudd to pick up the phone to their international counterparts. Shouldn't he have done more? Uh, the Prime Minister has handled this in the absolutely appropriate way, completely focused on our national interests. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, whatever way you look at this, I mean, this is uh, no doubt uh, one of the more challenging periods in our relationship. But our focus is on strengthening uh, our relationship moving forward. And uh, I mean, that's, that's what we're getting on with doing. If you really want to strengthen the relationship, I'd have to put it to you that you're failing. Quite clearly, this relationship has not been strengthened in the last few weeks. And if we want to look at how we should conduct our diplomatic affairs, we do have a precedent for this situation, which was when uh, it was found out that the US had tapped the phone of Angela Merkel. And Obama picked up the phone and he said sorry. What, what is the harm in just saying sorry? Why are we dancing around with regret? Why aren't we just sorry? Well, uh, we're dealing with this uh, situation in an Australian way, uh, according to our judgments, uh, as to what is in our national interest. And that is uh, what the Prime Minister is doing. That is what he will continue to do. Uh, and, and of course, uh, all of us uh, in the national interest strongly support our Prime Minister's efforts uh, in this regard. How is this going to affect everyday Australians? I mean, are, are you confident Australians traveling, traveling to Bali or elsewhere in Indonesia are going to be safe? Um, yes, I am. Okay. Well, we, we've mentioned that this is a very important relationship for us, not only diplomatically but economically. We've already had Agriculture Minister Barnaby Joyce has now cancelled a trip to Indonesia where he was going to talk about Indonesia investing and taking about 100,000 heads of cattle uh, as exports. What are the economic consequences of this? Well, I mean, w what he has done, he, he, ha he hasn't cancelled, he has deferred, and of course that trip will still pl pl take place. Uh, the trade relationship uh, with Indonesia will uh, strengthen uh, into the future, but of course uh, right now there are a number of issues to resolve. Uh, the Prime Minister has written uh, to uh, the President of Indonesia uh, in the last few days, as he said he would. Uh, let's just continue to uh, work through this uh, process of uh, fixing uh, the relationship from, from where it is moving forward, strengthening uh, the relationship from where it is moving forward, uh, rather than to continue to look backwards. What implications do you think this is going to have for the Bali Nine? And, and I guess more pressingly, Chappelle Corby, whose um, parole is, is up in a couple of days. Look, I mean, I think you're well and truly uh, stretching, uh, you know, my area of responsibility now. I mean, I, I came here to talk about economic matters and, and, and uh, budget matters and, and, and these sorts of issues. I mean, this is very much uh, not in my area of responsibility. I will, I will let uh, the Prime Minister and the Foreign Minister and others continue to comment on these matters that are obviously of a sensitive nature uh, as appropriate. You are a Cabinet Minister, though, so you obviously are aware of all the considerations that are going on 
in the government? Uh, well, I indeed I am, uh, with responsibility for the finance portfolio, and, and these are matters that are very much uh, in the province of the Prime Minister's and, uh, and the Foreign Minister's uh, area of responsibility. And, and given uh, the very important and sensitive nature uh, of, uh, of these issues, I will let them uh, comment on these matters as appropriate. Senator, I can assure you that we will be uh, going to issues pertaining to your portfolio, but if we can just stick with something a little bit more broader in this segment uh, in asylum seekers and broader protection. How how is it conceivable that Operation Sovereign Borders is still going to work given the Indonesian government has said they are no longer cooperating with us on that issue? Well, uh, we are totally committed uh, to stop the boats. We've inherited a situation at our borders from the previous government uh, that was uh, in a mess. Uh, there are many facets to Operation Sovereign Borders. Uh, obviously, uh, it is preferable uh, for uh, strong cooperation uh, with Indonesia to be uh, part of our, uh, the implementation of our policy there. But there are many facets to Operation Sovereign Borders. We will continue to do uh, everything we can uh, to stop the boats, as we said we would do in the lead-up to the last election. Do you think we'll see more boats now as a result of this uh, relationship breakdown with Indonesia? Uh, I, I'm not going to speculate on this, and, and our focus is on strengthening our relationship with Indonesia and getting uh, the situation back into a position uh, where we're working together strongly uh, in our mutual interest uh, to stop the boats, because it's not in Indonesia's interest, as it is not in our interest, uh, for the boats to keep coming. But if you look at the numbers alone, I think since September there was something like 1,150 people who were stopped getting on boats in Malaysia, Sri Lanka and Indonesia, the bulk coming from Indonesia, and that was majority majoritively uh, disrupted due to Indonesian authorities on the ground there. Uh, you're quite right that since the election there's been a significant reduction in the number of boats uh, arriving on our shores uh, and uh, we will continue to do everything we can uh, to uh, further accelerate uh, that, that trend uh, of stopping the boats. I mean, our, our determination is to stop the boats. We'll do everything we can to make sure that happens. Uh, and obviously, uh, strengthening our relationship with Indonesia moving forward is part of that. You're obviously in control of the budget bottom line, though. Are you making contingency plans for the fact that we may have to accommodate more asylum seekers? Well, uh, Jessica, our, um, our budget uh, estimates will be uh, updated in the usual way in the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. Obviously, we're looking right across government right now uh, as to uh, you know, what the various pressures on the budget are that we've inherited from the previous government. Uh, and, and we're making this judgment in an orderly uh, fashion and we'll provide the update uh, in the usual way at the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. OK, we are out of time for this break, but do stay with us. We'll have more with Finance Minister Matthias Kuhlmann next. You're watching Meet the Press, jump online and give us your thoughts via our Facebook page or with the Twitter hashtag MTP10. Back now to our guest today, Finance Minister Matthias Cormann. Senator, there are reports in the papers today that suggest former PMs are asking, requesting more perks in Julie Gillard and Kevin Rudd's case. They want not one office, but two offices. Is it right? Does a former PM need two offices? Well, look, I mean, I, I let them uh, work that out through the usual process. I'm, I'm not going to uh, go for some gratuitous political shots here. Um, uh, I, I'm sure that uh, this is going to be sorted out uh, in an appropriate fashion. Uh, well, that as finance minister, um, two officers, they, they enjoy a six-figure pension. Uh, is, it, is it fiscally responsible to be signing off on something like this? Well, obviously, we don't think they uh, do need two offices. I mean, but I mean, these things are currently uh, being worked through. And, um, you know, one, once it's finalised, uh, we'll let you know what the final arrangement is. OK, thank you. Minister, you're refreshingly good at succinct answers. <laughs> so I've got a yes or no question for you, which is, does Australia still have a budget emergency, as you suggested in opposition? Do we have a budget emergency? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, we inherited a budget uh, in very bad shape from the Labor Party, uh, a $30 billion deficit at the time of the election and deteriorating, uh, net debt heading uh, for $200 billion, gross debt uh, heading uh, beyond, well beyond $300 billion on the PFO uh, figures, and, and of course the trend that we uh, inherited was a deteriorating uh, trend, but uh, I mean, what uh, Labor has suggested at various times is uh, that somehow there wasn't an emergency because we weren't uh, dealing with things in the panicked, chaotic fa fashion that they would have uh, in the past. Uh, yes, so the, the short answer is yes, we're dealing 
uh, with a budget emergency, but we're dealing with it in a methodical, orderly, uh, purposeful fashion. And of course, the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook uh, will be a, a very clear indication on uh, where the true state of the budget is at once we've taken all of the uh, hidden problems into account uh, that we've uh, found out about since the election. So when will you be releasing the mid-year update? Well, as we've indicated, uh, we'll be releasing it uh, before Christmas. Uh, so, I mean, we're currently working our way through. We, we are keen to ensure uh, that the revenue data in particular is as accurate as possible, which is why we want the uh, September national accounts data reflected uh, in uh, the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook. That, is ex that will come out in early December. Uh, so um, then there are some processes to go through after that. And as soon as possible, uh, once we've uh, gone through all of that, uh, MAIFO will be ready for release. So a budget emergency, uh, we need to do something about it, economic update in December. Will there be nasties in that December update? Because if there's an emergency, you need to do something about it. And it seems like the government is, is ruling out quite a lot of things. No changes to super taxes, no changes to health and education spending, not increasing the age pension. Uh, there's going to need to be cuts. Where are you going to get them from? And are we going to see them in December? Well, we're going through a proper orderly process. I mean, we've already started, a, well, we've started to implement the savings measures that we've taken to the last election. That's one. Uh, we've also uh, ensured that there is uh, some appropriate scrutiny over the uh, discretionary grants uh, spending uh, that Labor uh, engaged in in the uh, shadow of the election. So that's, that's going on as we speak. Uh, and furthermore, we, of course, have announced the Commission of Audit, uh, which uh, uh, has the uh, job of identifying uh, opportunities for structural uh, efficiencies over the medium to long term, uh, which is going to report to us uh, by the end of uh, January with its interim report and by the end of uh, March with a final report. The Commission of Audit uh, very much we look at the size, scope uh, and efficiency of government and, and we will uh, reflect uh, the recommendations from the Commission of Audit that we accept uh, in the 2014-15 uh, budget. So uh, if you want to look at it at a high level, uh, the mid-year economic and fiscal outlook uh, will clearly uh, articulate the problem uh, that, we have, uh, that we have inherited from Labor's last budget, with Labor's last budget, uh, and the 2014-15 uh, budget will be our plan, the first coalition budget will be our plan uh, to fix uh, the budget emergency that we have inherited from the Labor Party. One of the key things that still needs to occur is the raising of the debt ceiling. If you don't get that passed, are we going to be facing a US-style government shutdown? Well, we're dealing, again, with a mess that we have inherited from the previous uh, government. Uh, there is one more week uh, until the Senate uh, comes back to sit and consider the debt ceiling legislation again. And I guess that's one more week. Uh, for Bill Shorten and Chris Bowen and the Labor Party to consider the national interest in this. Uh, the Labor Party over their six years in government uh, kept uh, kicking the dead can uh, down the road. They came back uh, every uh, year and so or, or so on, increasing the debt ceiling from 75 to 200 billion to 250 billion to 300 billion. Uh, at the time of the last budget, Labor knew uh, that the legislated uh, debt limit would not be sufficient to meet the uh, requirements, the financing requirements of the Commonwealth just for this calendar year. They knew then that by the end of this calendar year they would reach and exceed the legislated debt ceiling. That was quite reckless and irresponsible uh, the way uh, they dealt with this, not legislating to increase the debt ceiling at that time. So we are uh, doing what needs to be done responsibly uh, to provide uh, the uh, debt ceiling uh, that is required to fund the operations of government over the forward estimates. That is the responsible course of action and we call on the Labour Party uh, to stop this uh, political posturing and to start putting uh, the national interest first. But is it a possibility that we could face a, a government shutdown? Well, we, we, I'm not prepared to uh, entertain that thought. We, we're going to put the legislation back to the Senate uh, to increase the debt ceiling to $500 billion, which is the responsible course of action. Uh, and we call on the Labor Party uh, to uh, reflect on the national interest over the next week and to support that legislation when it comes back to the Senate in, in, in unamended form. Another thing that's been in the headlines this week is um, the retirement age. The coalition has ruled out raising the retirement age, but there's still not been anything said about um, accessing equity in people's homes. W what are you going to do about that? Is that a possibility? 
Well, the Productivity Commission made certain recommendations. The coalition doesn't have a policy to increase uh, the retirement age. Uh, I mean, the Productivity Commission is an advisor to government, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know, they are uh, independent and free to express their view. Uh, we are conscious of the fact that there are fiscal pressures that come uh, with the aging of the population, and of course, that's why uh, we have a commission of audit uh, consider. Uh, the uh, issues around size, scope uh, and efficiency of government so that we can position ourselves uh, for that in the best possible way. Our intention is uh, to uh, reflect our approach to these sorts of uh, challenges in the 2014-15 budget. Just finally, Senator, if we can take you to the Senate where it's responsible that a lot of uh, legislation is to be passed, the carbon tax being one of them, if it's defeated there twice, giving you the, the trigger for a double dissolution, given that we're in a budget emergency, would you be happy with sending Australians back to the polls? Well, again, I mean, our, our preference is uh, that Labor respects uh, the uh, vote of the Australian people. Uh, our, our preference is that uh, Bill Shorten and the Labor Party uh, accept the verdict at the last election. People at the last election voted against higher electricity prices. They voted for uh, scrapping uh, the carbon tax. They voted uh, for uh, strengthening of our economy uh, by not imposing the world's largest economy-wide uh, carbon tax on our economy. Uh, so uh, Bill Shorten and Labor should uh, let us uh, implement uh, the agenda that the Australian people voted for. Uh, so, I mean, again, I mean, between now and uh, the end of June, we think that there's a lot of water to go under the bridge and there's lots of opportunity for Bill Shorten to remind himself uh, of uh, the national interest. So you won't rule out that Australians could head back to the polls over this issue? Well, we will do whatever needs to be done uh, in order to implement our commitment at the last election uh, to scrap the carbon tax. That will achieve a saving of $550 a year on average uh, for Australian families. Uh, it will also, of course, help make Australian business more competitive again by bringing down the cost of doing business. So we'll do what needs to be done. Uh, okay. But Bill Shorten uh, should stop being in denial about the last election result. All right. Senator Cormann, thank you very much for your time today on Meet the Press. We appreciate it very much. Always good to be here. And Lani Scar and Jess Irvine, thank you for your insights as well. Thanks.